You're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Didn't you coach Burt Reynolds? Yes, I did. Was he any good? He was a defensive back. No, I know. Was he any good? I said. 103.9 FM LI News Radio presents The Weekend Crunch with Errol Marks and Josh Silverberg. Hello, Long Island, New York, and around the country. This is the Weekend Crunch. I'm your host, Daryl Marks. And there is no Little J tonight. No more Joshua Silverberg. I'm just kidding. Josh is right now taking care of his wife. So I just want to give a shout out to Josh and his family. Hopefully everything is okay. He will not be joining us tonight. No, ladies and gentlemen. My counterpartner of the night is, like always, the producer and my pain in the ass. <laughs> I didn't say ass. I said pain in the ass, Mr. Speedy Petey. What's up? Ask. I, yes, is is that know. your made up word of the day? It ask. Is. I, I, Even though it's an actual you, word. Do you want me to call you a pain in the ass? No. How many different variations of ass could we, we come up with? We could do pain in the ash. We could do pain in the ass. Well, if it, if it was pain in the ash, Ashley Sarge would be. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> so uh, there is no pain in the ash tonight. <laughs> and if it is, he's over there in the Rocky Mountains right now. Who so. knows? He's probably doing some cameo for a show. <laughs> well, that's true. I'm a little lost with the good old Ashley Sarge. As long as he's not the one filming it, it should be okay. <laughs> well, he might be an extra behind everybody. He's in every TV show and on every single movie. So not in every single movie, on every single movie. So I'm trying to help my English here, but Ashley Sarge doesn't make it easy. That's all. Anyways, we got a great show lined up for you. As you guys know, we will get into the NFL draft, the winners and losers, the New York Jets actually are winners. and Well, that's crazy to say. They're winners of something. But they won in the draft. The New York Giants made a significant trade in the first round that could solidify their team next year without Dave Gettleman. We'll see. And uh, a lot of teams really stood out in the draft. And, and there are winners and definitely losers in this year's draft. We will get into the New York Knicks. The hot New York Knicks playing good basketball on their West Coast skid. So we will get into the great and powerful New York teams. It's crazy to say that. Basketball New York teams. When was the last time we said that? The baseball teams are on a letdown, and the basketball teams are Well, hold on one second. Well. The Yankees are playing The Yankees good have played baseball. better. Yeah, I'll give them that. The Yankees are playing good baseball. John Carlo is not getting balls thrown at him right now because he's the hottest hitter in baseball. He might not get it by fans. At the rate that he's hitting the home runs, he might get it thrown <laughs> at by pitchers. It's very interesting when you talk about the Yankees and where the Yankees are and how the Yankee fans treat each and every one of their players. (laughs) And I'm a Yankee fan, so I I think it's very, very funny. And the Mets are eating their way out of whatever you call it. (laughs) They haven't found their way out of the situational hitting hole. We we can take Stephen Cohen for that one. (laughs) Yes, Stephen Cohen, the great analytics expert. (laughs) $341 million, right, to Francisco Lindor. Tell him what she's won, Bob. (laughs) A brand new nothing. (laughs) They didn't win or lose anything from last year. They just have the same problem as last year. Yeah, they can't hit. (laughs) Second best on base percentage in the National League. They still can't situational hit. Oh, man. So we'll get into the Mets a little bit later. And we have a very special guest. BYU analyst, voice, and everything. Sportsman, reporter, KSL Sports Cougar on Saturday's host, BYU Insider, Mitch. BYU Insider, Mitch Harper. Mitchy Witchy is a Steph Curry fan, and that's why Mitchy <laughs> Witchy might not be my best friend. I'm just kidding, Mitch. He actually enjoyed my Steph Curry monologue before we interviewed him on the great and positive Sports Loud Mouth. His interview will be on, and we will air it during the show. I think it's very interesting, especially if you are a Zach Wilson fan, on some of his thoughts on how he would fit with the New York Jets and where he sees him as a New York Jet head coach. I, mean, I almost said head coach. I'm sorry. <laughs> Player. Okay. The youngest head coach <laughs> by Adam far in NFL history, <laughs> if that was the case. Hopefully not Adam Gates. He'd probably be better than Adam Gates. I think a that's mouse, not saying much. I think a mouse would be better than Adam Gates, by the way, but that's just me. Anyways, first, we need to get into the NFL draft. And you talk about the New York Jets, and you could go back and forth on where the Jets were going in this year's draft. We obviously knew where they were going. They were going for a quarterback. I think they gave up on Sam Donald. They traded him for a six this year, a second and a fourth next year and they really believe that Zach Wilson was their guy and it was really leaking the last three to four weeks that Zach Wilson was going to be drafted by the New York Jets after his pro day his amazing pro day and Joe Douglas kept it a secret there was nothing that really leaked as far as the New York Jets organization is concerned but with him moving up on the board and how great his arm was and what he did in BYU and the fantastic season he had as a college football player I knew when he was going to be drafted that fans were going to be very excited 
Maybe because he looks like that California dream kid. Maybe you see him in Hanes Underwear. Miracle on 34th Street. Maybe we're going to see him there in Broadway. And we'll call him Broadway Wilson or something. I don't know. Broadway Wilson. Broad Wilson or Broady Horty Wilson. I don't know what we're going to call him, but nevertheless, it's not about his mom. It's about Zach Wilson, and thank you, Craig Carton, for giving us that information. But Zach Wilson went number two to the New York Jets, and I was absolutely not surprised where he was going. And He's a fantastic player. He has a great ability, a mobile quarterback that can move inside and out of the pocket, make every single throw. He's got a great arm. Fantastic player, Speedy. Yeah, I think Zach Wilson definitely has a great combination of mental traits and leadership roles in combining with his physical skills. Great arm, great on intermediate throws, great throwing on the run ability for somebody that isn't a Kyler Murray or Lamar Jackson or Cam Newton kind of freak runner, throwing to his left, to his right, making a lot of different throws and making a lot of different creative throws, hard throws, intermediate throws that really makes a difference. And the biggest thing mentally, too, that I took away from last season with BYU being an independent school, playing a lot of teams they didn't know they were going to play a lot of teams that weren't in their conference mixture all over the place different days of the week and he played well amidst all of that pressure and even the one loss they had to coastal carolina he still played well in the second half of that game and almost led them back again when you look at zach wilson and who he is as a player you know that he has the ability to make every single throw and he was a fantastic quarterback in his junior year and he didn't want to come back for his senior year and as well as he shouldn't because he was the second best quarterback on most people's list, except maybe a few, Chris Sims being one of them, and my list. I think he is a fantastic player. Really watching some of the film and who he is as a player, he, a born leader, I think he's going to fit like a glove in New York. And obviously, the New York Jets were looking at another position to fill in to protect their quarterback, and they went from all the way 23, the Jamal Adams trade, nine spots to guess where they went. They went 14 and drafted who did they draft? Speedy? Elijah Vera Tucker. Elijah Vera Tucker, the best guard the best interior lineman in this year's draft. Some people say he can play multiple positions on the offensive line. I think this was a great move for the New York Jets. It really is going to solidify their left side. And to me, when you look at him as a player, as a guy that you can trust and make the plays, and some people say another Quinn Nelson, I think that he can really fill in a lot of spots on that offensive line that is very weak for the New York Jets. Could go to the right tackle position. He could play on the left side. A lot of people are saying that he's going to play on the left side with Mekhi Beckham. So it's going to be interesting, Speedy. It really is. Yeah, the movement of Elijah Vera Tucker can make him versatile in a lot of different scheme alignments that they could do. With the 49ers offense that Robert Sala obviously was the defensive coordinator for, but that kind of offense does a lot of those pull blocks. So Vera Tucker's speed for his size really makes a big difference in terms of that kind of system with the outside running game. The Jets bringing a couple running backs. They drafted a running back in the fourth round in Michael Carter, a very shifty type of guy that kind of fits that kind of outside type rushing attack. And Zach Wilson, too, the same kind of thing. He could roll the left, he could roll the right. So they need somebody that has that kind of mobility. They didn't really need as much of the old school, bigger type of interior offensive lineman that we're used to seeing. They needed more of that type. And Vera Tucker, I'm not saying he's small, but he's definitely fast for his size, which is something that they needed in terms of that kind of system that, obviously, it's not going to be an exact Kyle Shanahan replica, but it's going to take a lot of similar concepts to it. And Vera Tucker's a nice fit for that kind of thing. Whether he plays tackle, whether he plays guard, but that kind of unique type of guard really could be a big difference. And a lot of people's boards, the New York Jets won this year's draft because Absolutely. in the second round, they drafted Elijah Moore, one of the best wide receivers in this year's draft. They <laughs> rated him a 91. When you, you get rated over a 90, you're a high-profiled prospect. They drafted two Elijahs and two Michael Carters. And all three of, well, first of all, the two Elijahs were rated over 90. And Zach Wilson rated over 91, 92 as well. This is the first time that any team in the first two rounds drafted over 90 players. That tells you how good the New York Jets drafted this year and how the players just fell to them. Vera Tucker, and, and now you talk about Elijah Moore. You look at who he is and what he is. Elijah Moore is one of the best wide receivers in this class. Speed guy, can play the slot, can play the outside, can do a lot of things. Punt return, speed guy, can't doesn't drop the ball. He doesn't have pot hands. I think that where the New York Jets are trying to fill in voids is really the offensive side of the ball. Elijah Moore, where a lot of people were not impressed what he was and where he was in Old Mess. 
uh, Ole Miss. Well, I called it Ole Miss because well, it is you're, Ole Miss. You're not, you're not inaccurate on that one based on their track record recently. <laughs> I think that you look at who he is as a player, I think he fits like a glove with the New York Jets and, and Zach Wilson and what they're going to try to do in the Kyle Shanahan offense speed. Yeah, I think his skill set very similar to the two receivers the 49ers have too. I think Brandon Ayuk, obviously I think is more all-around game, but also versatile slot guy can line up in the backfield. And then Debo Samuel is a lot more of that running back quick slot type. And I think Elijah Moore is somewhere in between when it comes to the overall level, but very similar to that kind of scheme fit where he can line up in the slot, he can line up in the backfield, run deep routes, he can run running back wheel routes if he wanted to, and can make a lot of difference after the catch. The 49ers offense was always known for the yards after the catch. Even if they didn't have the greatest receivers, they always were known for getting those extra yards, and they do the same thing with their running backs too. And the Jets now having one of their former ones in Tevin Coleman now too. So they're going to stress that kind of thing and that raw speed with Elijah Moore after the catch and the versatility will definitely be a great scheme fit for them. I love that pick right when it came in. He was my overall wide receiver five. But the fit just made a lot of sense with the Jets and that kind of offense. And even though they had Jamison Crowder already, Elijah Moore obviously a lot more upside, a lot more speed. And again, who says two slot guys isn't a bad idea either. They could do a lot of different things with that. And they line up one in the backfield and rotate the running backs the way they do. So there's a lot of different chess game type things that this offense could be more creative with, especially now with Zach Wilson, who can roll out all over the place. It is so fun to watch, and I think it's going to be exciting to watch this year with Michael Carter Jr., who a lot of people say is one of the best running backs in this class. He fell to the fourth round. The Jets obviously traded two third-round picks for Tucker, so they lost all their third-round picks, but it didn't make a difference because they still got a third, possibly late second-round draft pick in Michael Carter. I think where they are as far as the running back position and where they are are now solidifying it with Michael Carter. You have Coleman, you have Michael Carter, you have Pirine, you have Adams. You have a four-headed monster. I just think Michael Carter could be the future number one back for the New York Jets, especially what he did in UNC. Everybody forgets how talented he was. He was the best running back on that team. And even though Williams was drafted in front of him, a lot of people say the heart and soul on that backfield was Michael Carter. It's a counterpunch type thing with that kind of backfield. Williams was more of the bigger, pure runner type. He was shifty, agile, too. It wasn't just a straight north and south runner, but you saw the kind of player that Carter was, too. He's actually very similar, I think, to a guy like Tevin Coleman, but I think he could even be a better runner than that. But again, scheme fits is definitely what makes a difference. If Coleman doesn't work out with the injuries or just getting old or whatever, that's a very similar type. And it's going to counter LaMichael P. Ryan well, who's more of that pure runner type. He's a more of that bruise runner type. And Josh Adams, kind of the same thing, even though he's got some quickness to him, too. So I think it's a good counter value pick in terms of what they like. And if you look at the Jets' parallels to the 49ers' backfield, now they have that Tevin Coleman type, that shifty, even Jarek McKinnon. Shifty! When he was shifty! Jarek McKinnon type. I love it. And pass-catching type. That obviously, beady. obviously Not Col- a beady. Speak a beady. <laughs> obviously, Coleman is too, but again, can you trust him to stay healthy? And now, Michael P. Ryan is essentially like the Raheem Mostert in that kind of backfield too. So, you're seeing the parallels of what they're trying to build in terms of what is similar to that 49ers offense. It, it's going to be a fun season to watch this team. They have Added some defensive players in the later rounds in Sherwood. They drafted a lot of safeties that they're going to move to the linebacker position. You know what Robert Sala is going to like to run. He's going to bring up these DBs. He's going to try to blitz them in all different packages. Robert Sala is the king of that. You saw what he did with a San Francisco 49er defense that was really weak, banged up, and not the same defense that we saw two years ago that went all the way to the Super Bowl. So I think that where they are as an organization now with the New York Jets defensively, and Quinn Williams is out for 10 to 12 weeks, fractured part of his foot. So he'll be out. He'll miss OTAs and early preseason. So so a bigger role now for Sheldon Rankins have to take over. Absolutely. So, But when Quinn Williams comes back, they're going to really solidify that defensive line. I think the Jets are going to have a lot of fun with the packages that they can run this offseason and, and practice before the season starts. So I think they're in very, very good hands with Robert Sala in that defense. I think it's going to be very explosive. Don't be surprised if this is one of the best defenses in the AFC. Yeah, it's interesting because the Jets obviously could have went for either secondary help or edge rushing help, and they decided to go with more offensive approach in the draft instead. But what they in the did, first half, right? Which they what they did to counter that though, which I think is good, is they at least went for depth to have different guys. Different Look at the undrafted players. players they brought in. Yeah, versatile guys. Twelve of them signed. I think that makes a difference when at least you have the depth to work with. Salah can rotate those different guys because one of the biggest strengths with Salah is managing the defense last year when they had all those injuries, and the secondary even before that wasn't that good to begin with on paper. Now Jason Verrett, who 
who's normally an injury-prone guy stayed healthy all year, surprisingly, yet everyone else got hurt. And their safeties aren't amazing either, where that's what you're trusting. A front seven that's nice, but again, also was banged up too. So you could trust Robert Sala from that point to get the best out of them in specific roles. Even, you better get the best out of it. Again, Robbie, I don't you think better was, get the best out of it. <laughs> I don't think there was any one insane value pick in that late rounds, but I think the depth can make a difference in the creativity the of what depth. they could do Hear with that. what Sala has been capable of. The word of the day. The depths of the beast. The New York football jets. They're no longer gang green. They are gang beasts. With Robert Soller leading the role of Danger Boy. So it's going to be very fun. I think the Jets are going to be a very fun team to watch. I'm a Jet fan. You're a Giant fan. So we're a little lost with that. And when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into the New York Giants. We're going to get into what Mr. Gettleman did in the draft as well. And where do we see this team this year? Is it a good season or will it be a bad season? And we will get into the NFL draft. We'll get into Green Bay and what they didn't do. And is Aaron Rodgers on his way out after June? When we come back, me and Speedy will get into that here on the Weekend Crunch. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Weekend Crunch. I am your host, the one true amazing American, Errol Marks. And my co-host, no, it's not Josh, it's not Little J, it's not Capoose, no, it is Speedy Petey. Tidy Whitey Man himself, working the board and co-hosting for the great and powerful world of the Wizard of Oz, Joshua Silverberg. Anyways, uh, as you guys know, you can listen to our show every single Saturday. If it's not the Islander game, or if there's an Islander game, you'll hear us after at 10, 10 30, which it is tonight. But if the Islander games are not airing on Saturday, we will are live at 7 p.m. Remember, the show is brought to you by 103.9, the LI News Radio Network, and New York Sports Team Magazine, and the World Wide Sports Radio Network. You can download our app. How do you do that? You go to iOS, WWSRN, that's two W's. SRN or Android Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It is very easy. You can watch all our shows and read all our articles. We have a great product, and, and nobody can match the great and powerful Worldwide Sports Radio Network. So definitely tune in if you have great shows live every single day. Anyways, let's get into the rest of the draft and the New York football Giants. I think Giant fans were very, very upset, and they were taking shots at the Dallas Cowgirls, and and we call them the Cowgirls, but uh, I I like the Cowboys, but you don't because you're a Giant fan. Jerry Jones probably reached out to the New York football Giants and told them, listen, the Eagles want to move up. If you want the great Heisman Trophy winner in Devontae Smith from Alabama, the Heisman Trophy winner, was sitting right there, right for the take-in. The (laughs) Eagles jumped ship and jumped all the way from 12 to 10 to draft Devontae Smith really screwed the New York Giants. The New York Giants then decided to trade down all the way to 20 with the Chicago Bears. The Chicago Bears moved up at 11, drafted Justin Fields crazy, and the Giants fell to number 20. They got two first rounds, a fourth and I think a fifth. And they got Mr. Tony from Florida. And I, I think Tony was a good pick. I just don't know if he was the fourth best wide receiver on the board. I think Elijah Moore was. I think they should have drafted Elijah Moore. And now you look at the Giants. They have two first rounds next year and they have a significant amount of picks. They got 10 picks next year. They really solidify themselves in the first round, especially with the Bears. And nobody expects the Bears to be any good this year. So what does that tell you? The Giants could have a top 10 pick and draft two separate positions in the top 10 next year, which really could solidify their defense or their offense moving forward. So the Giants I think did very, very well later in the draft, especially in the second round at number what, Speedy? They traded back with Miami, so I think it was number 18 in the second round. And what did you think of their pick in the second round? I really liked that. He was my favorite pass rusher when healthy in the draft. Now, yeah, I had some issue with, I think, a knee contusion last year, and he missed a lot of time with Georgia, but he was their best outside rusher for a while. Very strong for his size, a good combination of moves with Aziz Ojolari, and I think, yeah, he might still have a little more room to grow because of his size. But Just again, a little bit. A little that, bigger. Speedy's head's small. Yeah. You know? So. My head is average. It's no, small gonna, compared to the rest of my family. A small but. head, a little pea brain head. <laughs> no, I do not have a pea brain. But okay. Well, sometimes I wonder if 
you do. In some aspects, I do. But well, there is a lot of aspects to that. That's for sure. But I will admit that to you. All don't of have you. to admit it. I'm going to admit it for you. So that's you've all. only known me for three years. That's all I have to know you. Three years is more than enough to know you, Speedy. That's for sure. All right. Well, mm-hmm. judge that accordingly. But oh, yeah. regardless, I, I, I love the pick of Ojolari. I think that was a great value. Oh, what, the, what they got uh, again. Going back to the Bears pick, I, I didn't mind them trading back for the spot. I still could have seen them getting good value with Rashawn Slater in that spot if they decided to stay at 11. Obviously, Devontae Smith was who I wanted, but the Eagles, again, they decided to jump right in front and rip the hearts out of Giants fans. <laughs> but, again, they, I, you can't blame them for doing that. That was the best move they could have done. And they, are you going to cry about that? They made it work, Speedy, yeah. you going to cry about that? Is, oh, is, are you okay? I will you, when Devontae Smith gets 150 yards Do you want me to rip your underwear off so you can use it as a tissue? How's that sound? Why would I need you to rip it off? Sometimes you've told the fans that you don't wear it sometimes. So I said it once. Well, one time is better one than One time. Well, one time is a lot. One definitely averages out to better than none, right? Okay, congratulations. So just tell the fans that you don't really wear underwear. That's very fitting for a lot of the fans. No, nice try. But well, I'm just telling you the truth. But I think the Giants didn't do that bad in this year's draft. I rated them a B. I think that they got a lot of talent later in the rounds, especially in the second round and, and definitely in the third and fourth round. They moved down twice. I think Gettleman is learning a little bit from Joe Douglas, really solidifying where this team is. I think the Giants are position in a very good way. I just don't like the Kenny Galladay free agent signing in the offseason. I think they spent a lot of money for Kenny Galladay. I don't know if he's a number one. I think he's a better number yeah. two. And I think they really put position themselves in a very bad position moving forward if they want another wide receiver that becomes available. Maybe if Julio Jones becomes available in June, they ha- could have had a shot at Julio. Instead, they're not going to have a chance at Julio because they got Kenny Galladay. So, that's not a good sign. Yeah, and a bunch of other needs. So now they have to solve those other needs rather than going after a receiver that would have been much better value than giving $18 million a year to Kenny Galladay, who is very Kenny? inconsistent Gee. and injury prone. And I agree with you. He doesn't really have that upside of a number one receiver to me. So I think because of that, they really had to solidify those other areas now. And they did it to some extent in the draft, but they didn't have a lot of draft picks to work with. I know you say you like what they did in the third round with the corner. They took in Aaron Robinson. I don't know if they really needed a corner, though, as much in that spot, being they signed a Dory Jackson this offseason. They got some good production. Is he adorable? You said a Dory. Adorable Jackson. People That's are... his new nickname. I'm going to call him. Adorable <laughs> Jackson. I'm sure he's been called that before. But <laughs> I don't know if he's adorable. Okay. Well, so. that's up for people that actually care about the visuals to determine. The, well, you have small heads. So I judge by my visual. I judge by the contract and by the position of need, which I don't mind the contract by any means, and I don't mind the player, but I don't know if the Giants necessarily needed him. You don't mind the player. No, I like the player, Adoree Jackson. I just, Do you think he likes you? He doesn't know me. Well, thank God he doesn't know you, because if he had to know you, I think he'd run. No. So that's fair. I give that a 95% chance. Well, there is a 95% to everything, and maybe a 10% of nothing. So who knows? And that would give you 105 of maybe nothing or maybe negative something. What Good. do you think? Let's see if you have uh, any mathematicians to back that one up. Well, I'm not a math guy, but I'm just giving you a positive notion to it. Anyways. But nonetheless, I don't think they really needed a corner in that spot. I think there was other areas they could have gone in. I actually like the corner they drafted from Oklahoma State in the sixth round in Rodarius Williams because he was thought of as more of a fourth, fifth round type. So I actually think they found good value there. Beyond that, outside of the Ojolari pick, I wasn't crazy about any other one. Tony's a nice player. I wouldn't have taken him in that spot. I, I know you didn't enough, like it. I think there were other receivers they could have taken later because Jeff he, liked them. Again, I don't mind the player, Tony. I think the pick in that spot, especially with a lot of receivers still left, they could have waited for the Elijah second round. Moore. Yeah, they could have taken Elijah Moore. They could have taken Rondell Moore. Obviously, the Ravens took Rashad Bateman later, but they could have taken Tevin Jenkins or maybe Darisaw or one of those tackles in that spot or even Jeremiah Wusu to give him a coverage linebacker type. Uh Uh-oh, Josh didn't like Darisaw, so you don't draft him if Joshy Boy doesn't like him. So Josh is a universal draft expert. I don't know about that, but he didn't like him because he had small arms. He has a small brain. So I think there was better value there and then maybe waiting on the receiver than doing what they did. Again, I don't mind them trading back. The return package was pretty solid for what they got back, but I wouldn't have taken Tony in that spot. I think it was a great draft. I think that when you look at all the teams that were drafting in the top 10, the Bengals getting Jamar Chase, I think that definitely was something that they needed. They needed a number one guy. I know they needed an offensive lineman to protect Joe Burrows. They solidified that later in the round. They added three offensive linemen. The Bengals really solidified some of the weaknesses that they had, and they add Jamar Chase, I think, the best wide receiver in this class. So I like that. I like Sertain going to the Broncos. I think that really fit what they needed. And they've been known 
over the years to have a great secondary and a great front yeah. seven. They build around a the defense. Their coach is the lead defensive mind on that team. So I think they're really going to try to solidify it. Who knows? Aaron Rodgers might he- be heading over there very, very soon after June because there are stories coming out that he has no interest to in playing for the Green Bay Packers this year. And during the draft, it was almost a done deal that he was going to get traded to the Broncos. It just didn't happen. I do believe that in June, he will be pushing his way out of Green Bay. I don't care what Green Bay says, and they're going to try to save him or trying to bring him back. It's not happening. I think he's on his way out. I think the fact that he wants to be the guy that's running and, and being the voice of Jeopardy, I think he's only going to play another year or two. He's going to try to win another Super Bowl. He's getting married to a movie star. I think he's done. I really do. I think he's one of the greatest quarterbacks I've ever seen and one of the greatest quarterbacks quarterbacks of this era, but I think he's done. I think he likes the fact that he knows who he is, and I think just like Tony Romo, he's going to make a lot of money on TV more than he or he has to worry about as far as getting hit and having brain damage, so I think that's where Aaron Rodgers is going to be heading. Yeah, I could see it too, because the Broncos do have a history with bringing in the veteran quarterbacks. They Starting this entry, they had Jake Plummer. Obviously, they brought in Peyton Manning later in his career, and he did fantastic for the Broncos in the beginning of his— Won a Super Bowl. Yeah, well, won a Super Bowl in his worst year, but yeah, still— And went to two Super Bowls. Yep, and obviously John Elway lasted until he was like 40 years old when he was with the Broncos. So they've had a history of bringing in these veteran-type quarterbacks. Whether they work out or not is another question, but based on that kind of thing and based on the fact that they've drafted well, they have a lot of offensive skill players that are going to make it enticing for Aaron Rodgers. They're going to help Aaron Rodgers out a lot with Jerry Judy, with Cortland Sutton if he's back healthy. Jerry Judy. They drafted Javante Williams in the second round of running back. They still got Melvin Jude Gordon Lord. there. They lost Philip Lindsay, but they still got Melvin Gordon there. Noah Font's a nice young tight end. And their offensive line's not great, but I think it's still better than some of the lines that he's played with throughout his career, especially with guys like Balaga, TJ Lang getting hurt a lot of the time when he was in Green Bay. Even Corey Lindsay to an extent got hurt a lot. They've had better lines than what some of those banged up lines have been in Green Bay. So I think he, they could definitely make that work. Besides the Chiefs, it's definitely an easy enough division where they could definitely be a wild card type team because they're very talented. The Chiefs definitely won this offseason. It's solidifying their offensive line, adding Thune, adding a great offensive lineman in Humphreys in the second round, and then tr- making that trade for Brown with the Baltimore mm-hmm. Ravens. I think they solidified their offensive line, losing their big time left and right tackle. So I think Kansas City's going into the season as strong as possible and, and definitely going to be the favorites coming out of the AFC. It's going to be very, very interesting. But when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we had a great guest on the Sports Lab Mouse, and we're going to have the replay of that interview. Why? Because he's going to explain why Zach Wilson is the perfect fit for the New York Jets. We will be talking to KSL Sports Cougar Sports Saturday host and BYU insider Mitch Harper here on the Weekend Crunch. What? 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 BYU! 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 What? What? Zach! Zach! Wilson! 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 That's right! Rick! Rick! Rick it! Rick it! Rick it! Rick it! Rick it! As you guys know, this is the Weekend Crunch. I'm your host, Errol Marks. My co-host, the great and powerful world of nothing, Speedy Pete. Remember, you can listen to our show every single Saturday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. New York Eastern Time only on 103.9. The LI News Radio Network brought to you by New York Sports Team Magazine and the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. Download the Worldwide Sports Radio app by going to iOS, WWSRN, or Android Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And by the way, guys, before we get our special guest, I am very excited to say that I am here to stay. And I love Fruity Pebbles in a major way. See, I'm selling that. What do you think, Speedy? You think I'm going to... Make and I gotta get some. If you get on a Fruity Pebbles commercial, that would be quite. I, I would definitely like the endorsements from Fruity Pebbles if they want to help me out here. They can send me whatever they want. I will hold those boxes up because I love the great Fruity Pebbles. Anyways, our guest of the day, ladies and gentlemen, BYU analyst, voice, and everything, sportsman, reporter, KSL Sports Cougar on Saturday's host, BYU Insider, Mitch. Harper, what's going on, Mitch? Hey, what's going on, guys? They made that a mouthful, didn't they? My job title there. Well, it wasn't you. <laughs> it was my great and powerful producer that likes to throw. Have you ever played dice, Mitch? 
Not much in the gambling scene out here in Utah. So not much dice in my uh, background. In games of dice, or you, you like to play dominoes. You like to play crazy eight with your yeah. cards. You got to have a certain amount of cards. You got to land on a certain number to win. Well, Speedy always lands on the wrong number. He is the wrong number of the dominoes, the dice, and the crazy eights. But I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're joining us. Mitch, so tell us a little bit about your thoughts on the great Zach Wilson. I know a lot of people out there in Utah love him. There were stories coming out over the last couple of weeks before the draft that Zach Wilson was going to be the Jets guy. When you heard that the Jets were interested in Zach Wilson after his pro day, were you surprised that the Jets were so interested in him and what do you think of him as a player moving into the NFL? I wasn't surprised at all because I thought that Zach Wilson was head and shoulders better than Justin Fields and, and Trey Lance. I mean, Zach Wilson is kind of the, what the NFL wants right now as far as that arm talent. He's elite in that regard. I mean, I remember before he even played a game at BYU, I said, this guy's the next Baker Mayfield. I took a lot of heat for it. So I'm, I'm with you there. I understand taking the blowback on a hot take on social media. Back when Zach Wilson was an unknown guy, I was saying this guy is going to be a big time talent because when you mention people out in Utah liking him now, well, a year ago, there wasn't hardly anyone liking this guy. I mean, there was fans emailing and, and reaching out to BYU's coaches saying, please don't start Zach Wilson. Everyone's saying they love him now. But a year ago, after a dip <laughs> in his sophomore year due to the reconstructed shoulder injury, he didn't have many supporters, but he kept grinding and working and continued to show why he was going to be a head and shoulders, the best quarterback BYU's had in, in many years. And and he proved it in the draft process, too. You combine his personality in terms of his work ethic and then also what he did on the field and in his film. Because we know in this virtual world that we're in with everything was kind of not your typical combine and draft setting. They had to rely on the film and the film was elite. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that the Jets were all in on Zach Wilson, especially with all the manpower that was there at Pro Day with Joe Douglas, Robert Sala and the offense coordinator. It's no brainer. He was the number two guy. And I think it's going to work out quite nicely. One of the things I always thought that stood out with Zach Wilson, the season they had this year, BYU had to play a lot of games against opponents they didn't know about a lot of the times, different schedules because they were independent. And Zach Wilson still played phenomenally amidst all that, was a Heisman candidate for a while. Do you think that is something that mentally will give him an advantage in the NFL over these other quarterbacks that either played for bigger schools or like you were saying, with Trey Lance is still very raw? And even North Dakota State for an FCS team too is one of the most talented teams. So do you think that's something that could give Wilson an edge right away, maybe to be better quicker or good against competitive teams? It's going to be interesting because the one thing I think people continue to always knock on Zach Wilson is his competition. The thing is, like Trevor Lawrence, like Mac Jones, Zach Wilson was on teams where his squad was head and shoulders better than anyone. Trevor Lawrence was in the ACC, sure, but who was good in the ACC? Clemson every single week because of the supporting cast around him, they were four touchdown favorites, similar to that of what BYU was doing. Zach Wilson, though, his just preparation for the game. I mean, that's what makes him, I think, a great prospect. And I think you're not going to have any questions about this guy not being prepared. It's a matter now of him being able to simply execute and having the pieces around him. And with the draft class that the Jets put together last week, he's going to have some young pieces starting from the ground up to build this thing and actually become that folk hero that Jets fans have been craving for so many decades. So I think it's a great fit. And I think that he's going to be prepared. I think that's one thing that Jets fans can bank on is that this guy is not going to cut any corners. He's going to be relentless. I mean, the moment after he gets drafted, he comes back home to Draper in, in Utah. They have a big family party on the, over the weekend, a bunch of people celebrating. But that guy's in his living room studying all the Jets players, who they drafted, studying all their offensive film, just studying anything he can. I mean, the guy broke down literally every single BYU spring practice this past March for a team that he's not going to be a part of, but he cares about BYU. The guy just loves football. He loves film study. He's all in in that regard. It's now just simply having the offensive line, having the pieces around him. If you give him the protection, he's going to make the throws. He's going to succeed. Mitch, what was the difference that we saw a year ago? I know he had the shoulder issue, but I mean, what a drastic change to go from. I mean, only throwing, I believe it was three interceptions this past year. It was incredible how his completion percentage went up. The jump balls were on point. He's so accurate with his throws. Easy release when he releases the football. What is the difference from a year ago where nobody wanted him to start to now all of a sudden being the number two overall pick in the draft? It's just a sudden change. Everyone focuses on the injury, and that's valid. I mean, he was a reconstructed shoulder. Even back when he was in high school at corner 
Boner Canyon, he was dealing with some of the shoulder injuries then. That's why he didn't maybe reach the lofty recruiting status that maybe he could have had he been fully healthy with that shoulder. But I also think that no one brings this up is that the offensive coordinator role, Jeff Grimes has always been the offensive coordinator the past three years for BYU. But midway through that point of the 2019 season, Kalani Sitake, BYU was two and four. They kind of shifted the responsibilities to more of Aaron Roderick, who was the passing game coordinator, but he started to have more control of the offense. And I think that shift did wonders for, I think, Zach Wilson also helped out some of the backup quarterbacks who filled in for Wilson, who was battling a little bit of the hand injury when he was missing some games in that 2019 season. But that, to me, was where BYU's offense really took off. BYU was coy about it, said, oh, it's a collaborative effort, and Jeff Grimes is still the offensive coordinator. But anyone that was in the know knew Aaron Roderick, the passing game coordinator, who was at the draft party last week for Zach Wilson, he was the guy that was developing the quarterback, and he would even tell you, Jeff Grimes, that Aaron Roderick deserves all the credit in the growth and the development of Zach Wilson. And him getting more autonomy over the offense, I thought, did wonders for BYU, and it set the table for BYU in 2020, even with a restart structured schedule amidst COVID-19 that their offense took flight. There was a lot of confidence before the restructured schedule that with seven power five teams, we're going to put up huge numbers with Zach Wilson at quarterback because he was healthy. There was the talk about the quarterback debate and the captain and all of that, but people internally knew Zach Wilson was going to be the guy. They just wanted to make sure that he was going to still put in all that work that I talked about a moment ago, and he did, and he passed with flying colors, and he was lights out in fall camp, and BYU's offense took flight. But yes, kind of reallocating the offense coordinator duties but that had a big role and there was just a great relationship between Zach Wilson and Aaron Roderick that I thought worked a lot better in the communication for Zach to really have control of that offense we are talking to KSL Sports Cougar on Saturdays host and BYU insider Mitch Harper Mitch we talk about Zach Wilson like he's a god some people like him some people absolutely love him Chris Sims put him hand over fist the number one quarterback in this class I watched BYU play maybe three or four times this year I saw him in the ball game I was very intrigued on what I saw him in the ball game against a team that was a top 10 team in the beginning of the season kind of fell out of the top 10 when you look at his quarterback play is there a particular quarterback that you've seen in the NFL or college football in the past that you can compare his skills and who he is as a player. I really thought it was Baker Mayfield. The kind of the attitude one. Zach Wilson, he comes off maybe a little bit of an arrogant guy, but I think it's just confidence in his belief of who he can be as a player. And I just think his ability to be able to run, make plays out of the pocket and just his athleticism. He is a good athlete, but what's been positive development for Zach Wilson in his career is the fact that he understands he can't take hits. That was one thing impressive about his 2020 season that really doesn't get talked about much is the guy, if he ever ran, he was getting out of bounds. He was going to slide. He barely got hit. He had a great offensive line in front of him. He just makes smart decisions. And Baker Mayfield is someone, I thought in terms of college careers, they were very similar. I hate to kind of compare to the Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers. I know that Zach Wilson studied those guys a ton and he looks up to those type of quarterbacks, but I really like the comparison of Baker Mayfield. I've always believed that for years now and kind of stick with that one. But yeah, Zach Wilson, you could draw a lot of parallels to other quarterbacks because he'll pick from certain quarterbacks what they do in a given week and then he'll incorporate it into the BYU offense, what they did last season. That was evidence, again, with Aaron Roderick having more control. BYU gets a win at Houston, and they incorporate that flip pass that Patrick Mahomes did with the Chiefs. They use that in a win over Houston this past season. So he's someone that just studies a ton of film and analyzes all those QBs. Maybe he could be a co-host with Aaron Rodgers on Jeopardy. That would be great. The Zach Wilson of the world with the Aaron Rodgers of the world. Two good-looking guys, one older, one younger, and they could throw a ball back and forth while they're asking questions. That would be And, and there's, there's some built-in storylines, too. I mean, Zach Wilson was calling out Aaron Rodgers during the season they for— did. His lack of swag and Aaron Rodgers clapped back at him. It was like, hey, I got the swag like youngster. Like, hey, just because I got the long sleeves and the visor, like doesn't mean I don't have swag. So there's some built in a uh, little bit of rivalry already between those two. So it can work out. <laughs> well, we don't even know where Aaron Rodgers is going to play next year. If all we know, he's playing for the CFL or maybe he's playing for Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a trait, whether it's physical or mental or within his game, his skill set that stands out more than any other quarterback in this class and maybe a trait that you think he's already going to be maybe top 10 in right away, even compared to other quarterbacks in the NFL. So what would that be in your opinion and why? I think the velocity that he throws the ball with, if you've got a radar gun on his throws, I mean, he's the type of guy that can get in the 60 miles per hour. I mean, the improvement that he's made when he got in touch with 
John Beck, a former second round NFL draft pick, former BYU great. That's been huge too in Zach Wilson's development as a quarterback. He just throws the ball with great timing, great precision. He's really good too in the intermediate throws. He's not a guy that's going to put too much on his throws. His ball placement is great. So I just think that his touch with the football and the velocity, those are some of the things that stand out to me with Zach Wilson. And this preparation too, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to go a long ways as well. So I think those things stand out above the rest. Two-parter for me. One, we heard after he got drafted by the Jets that he's never even been to the East Coast before, and now he's going to New York City. Run, New Zach, Jersey, run! Run carrier. for your life, Zach! I would I'd give him advice. I could tell him all of that. I'd run the hell away. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going from a place like Utah, which is, I think, a little more quieter compared to New York City, which is madness 24-7, and that's a big step to go in taking into that. Do you think he'll be able to handle that one? And two, why was there a reason as to why he was not named the captain? What was the issue with that going on yeah with the first part he's got a lot of family that live in the new york area so i believe he's visited quite a bit in the new york he's never lived out there he's always been in the state of utah but he's visited quite a bit on the east coast so maybe there's some familiarity in in that regard and from provo in salt lake media there's quite a few outlets that cover boe sports i mean boe's got a passionate fan base all consuming but it's just going to be a different level type of questions asked he's not going to have a program protecting him he's got to answer he's got to step up to the music and that was one thing that he was willing to do anytime there was adversity that faced BYU he'd step up get in front of the mic and answer tough questions if needed but I think it's going to be a different level obviously in New York and I think that's one thing that I am very curious to see how he does handle that just the amount of coverage really having the weight of a franchise on his shoulder of this magnitude I just think it's going to be very unique and I think that's one of the big questions I do have as far as the captain spot goes that was a deal where BYU they had named a bunch of starters at the beginning of fall camp in 2020 And at that time, BYU still hadn't officially named who their starting quarterback was going to be. And it was really just kind of a timing deal. Again, people around the program, they knew Zach was due for a huge bounce back year from what he did in his sophomore season. But until he was officially named the starting quarterback, that's when he officially got the title. And I think it was an equipment issue in week one where they just forgot to put the C on the jersey against Navy. But then in week two against Troy, he had that captain C on his jersey. So I think it was just kind of an oversight in regards to an equipment oversight or error. But yeah, he was always the captain. Once he officially got named the starting quarterback for that week one game against Navy, he was officially the captain. So it was really just kind of a timing deal, if anything. We are talking to KSL Sports Cougar on Saturday's host and BYU insider Mitch Harper. Now, Mitch, looking at the New York Jets with all the acquisitions they made in the offseason in free agency and then looking at their draft, one of the top three grades of the whole draft. And this is a problem what the Jets have done over the years. They bring in quarterbacks and they don't build around the quarterbacks. They decide, hey, you know what? We're going to bring in a quarterback. We're not going to add any offensive players. We're going to add a bunch of defensive players. They're going to win with just a quarterback. It doesn't work like that. Well, this year they added Zach Wilson. Then they added a big-time offensive lineman in Tucker. And then all of a sudden, they get Elijah Moore in the second round, the first-round talent. And then they added Carter, who is a very talented running back. When you look at the acquisitions that they made, do these players fit the talent that we've seen in BYU of Zach Wilson's? I think so. I watch a ton of college football and I, I love draft season and Michael Carter was someone that I loved watching in the ACC just from afar. And I just think these are great fits. And that's why out here in Utah, when there was buzz building early in the draft process that Zach was linked to the Jets, I think a lot of BYU fans were like, ah, oh, gosh, it's going to be a mess. The Jets just don't have success with quarterbacks. But when you kind of dig down and look at just the personnel and how Zach comes into a franchise where it's starting from the ground up. And I think that's a great setup too for Zach to be in, to be with Joe Douglas, who by all accounts, you guys would know better than I, but I mean, just his background with his scouting department, just the way he drafts, it just looks like there's a new feel, a new sense of optimism with the New York Jets. We don't get many Jets games out here in Utah unless we have the Sunday ticket. You're lucky. Uh, but <laughs> you have to deal with that. It, it was like a great setup for everyone to kind of just build brick by brick and kind of move through this together. I think that's going to be good for Zach because I really think in year one, I don't know if Zach's a guy that's going to just take the Jets from two or three wins to suddenly the playoffs. I think it's going to be a gradual deal. But the fact that there's so much newness around it might afford him that luxury to maybe have a three year plan. So I think by year three, you got to get him to the playoffs. You got to get the Jets by then. In into the playoffs and contending for the AFC East with how much new personnel, new players, new coaches, new everything, that might be enough time to afford Zach Wilson that luxury to get there by year three to get to the playoffs and contend for the AFC East. Well, this is the best thing about this. As long as he doesn't see ghosts in New England or 
as long as he doesn't hit somebody's butt when he's trying to run and trying to get away from a player, we're in good shape. And by the way, both games from both those quarterbacks were against two New England. So I think that when you look at both players, Sam Darnold and Mark Sanchez, you're bringing a young quarterback like Zach Wilson and the talent that he is. And, and a lot of people think that he has one of the best arm talent that we've seen since Patrick Mahomes. They compare his skill and his ability, his arm strength, his ability to be mobile. He doesn't even have to plant his feet. He could throw 25 yards on a dime. It's really amazing what we've seen on film. But in a big game, when the pressure is on, could he handle the pressure here in New York, knowing that the New York Jets have not been a good organization, have not been a good team, and haven't won anything in 50 years? It's a great question. I mean, because there are examples in Zach Wilson's career of big games, big moments, where he comes up short. BYU in Coastal Carolina, BYU's undefeated. You win that game, you're probably going to a New Year's Six Bowl, and you come up short by one yard. 2019, BYU comes up short against Utah. 2018, their rival, they're up by 20 points on Utah, and they give up 21 and answered, and then BYU falls short in that one. So there has been examples of that in Zach Wilson's career, even dating back to his high school days. But I just feel, again, that the way that he elevated himself, and he made others better around him. I was hearing in your guys' first segment about Steph Curry. Now Steph Curry doesn't make guys better. Zach Wilson lifts guys. I mean, he got everyone to buy in to this all-in, relentless approach where it's like, hey, let's sacrifice going out on dates. Let's work. Let's grind. Let's make a name. Let's make a legacy. As he likes to say, prove them wrong to the doubters. He got the whole program to buy him because BYU football for the last decade or so, they haven't done anything. People probably on the East Coast, they think of BYU, probably Steve Young, Jimmy McMahon. Well, that's 40, 30 years ago. I mean, that's been forever ago. The last 10 years, BYU's done nothing. Zach Wilson finally gave BYU fans and the program something to get excited about. And that's because uh, I think he set the tone from a work standpoint and he lifted everyone around him and he got guys to buy on. I mean, he got guys that were once a preferred walk-on to be selected as NFL draft picks this last weekend at wide receiver and Dax Mill is going to the Washington football team. So I just think that Zach Wilson is a leader and I think that he's going to be someone that can carry a franchise and he's just got to be able to get the opportunity to show that that clutch factor because there has been examples where he has come up short but I think he always bounces back from adversity it's not Steph Curry it's Steph Berry because that's what he does he buries his team Josh was actually bringing up something when he told me that we were having you on that you actually broadcasted every Zach Wilson game from high school and in college so what were some of your favorite games that you have broadcasted and what are some of the biggest moments or funniest moments from those games especially in high school where it doesn't really get covered as much nationally as much. Yeah, it covered a lot of Zach Wilson in his career for sure. And, and, you know, every BYU game, I think one of the biggest things for me that I remember of his career was his first BYU spring practice. I just remember thinking just the arm talent was good then. I mean, and this was a guy that was an under the radar recruit. And you're thinking this guy's got the potential to be something special right away. His first start against Hawaii in 2018, this was a BYU offense that barely could score any sort of points. He comes in the first game, gets his first career start, puts up 49 points, leads BYU's offense to a big day as the youngest starting quarterback in BYU history. I thought that was pretty noteworthy. He goes in the bowl game that same season, goes a perfect 18 of 18, and was just flawless. And it wasn't just dink and dunk, scream pass. It was going downfield. I mean, 30 plus, 40 plus yards in the air. The receivers were making the catches, but he was putting in spots for them to make big plays. That was a heck of a performance. And then also, I think, just some of his things off the field, too, where, again, the, the confidence that could be interpreted as, a little bit of cocky, but just he always had this belief that he is the next level talent. He is the star quarterback because, again, there were so many people around these parts that thought, nope, Zach Wilson is not the guy. He just kept working. He just kept grinding. That, to me, will always kind of be my lasting image of Zach Wilson, just that tireless work ethic because his family, the mom and dad, they're great people. They're fantastic. You get to know them at all. They are great, and it's just a, a great family, great family unit there at the Wilson family, and I just think that that work ethic was top-notch. And to me, BYU's got a decorated history of BYU quarterbacks that come through the program. I think he's right there in probably the top four or five. He, he's an all-timer for sure, and he left his legacy for sure. Two part for me, Mitch. What are some aspects of his game that worries you after seeing him in high school and, of course, college? What are some things that you might fear in regards to him going to the NFL? And my other part is, is he somebody that can start right away? Or is he somebody that maybe needs to sit and learn for a couple of games, and then you put him in slowly but surely? 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing for Zach that he's got to work on is when the pocket collapses, he's got to stay in the pocket because at BYU, last year especially, he was staying pretty much upright the entire time. BYU had a great offensive line. They had a top 70 draft pick this past weekend. Consensus All-American. They had a lot of good offensive linemen, including an undrafted free agent, Tristan Hodges, with the Jets now. Could maybe compete, be a deep sleeper, maybe to compete for that right guard spot for the Jets. But Wilson didn't have much pressure. And when the pocket collapses, he's got to be able to stay in that pocket and make the big throws for the Jets. And also, I think just the injury history too, the shoulder and also the hand injury. He did have some extended periods where he was out due to injury and it completely impacted his stats from 2018, his freshman year to his sophomore those injuries, you saw a dip everywhere statistically across the board. Zach Wilson took a step back in his second year because of injury. So that's going to be something I'd be monitoring. But yeah, he's got to be the week one guy. I think in a perfect scenario, because you look at all the great quarterbacks in the NFL and you look at their backgrounds, Mahomes, Brady, Aaron Rodgers, they all took a year or two to kind of learn from the older guy and then step in. Zach Wilson's just not going to have that luxury. So even if he's not ready, he's got to be the guy from day one because he has got the weight of the Jets franchise on his shoulders and he's got to be ready. And that's where, again, that work ethic's got to come into play. And he's got to know that playbook inside and out if he wants to give the Jets to have any have any chance to improve that win total in 2021. Over here in New York, Craig Carton interviewed Zach Wilson and said some Interesting things. He's been taking a lot of heat from it, being that he said that his mother was hot and Zach Wilson had nothing to say. And uh, I want to apologize for Craig Carton's stupidity because that's not something you say to a young kid when he gets drafted. That's not what he wants to hear. He just wants to hear about what he is. The fact that his mom is the center of attention on draft day had nothing to do with him being drafted. So I want to apologize. When you look at BYU football right now, and by the way, one of our fans asked me to ask you, the BYU mascot, the Cougar, what do you think about his dancing skills? Osmo is <laughs> an elite dancer. Seeing that man firsthand, I interviewed him after he got named the national champion. That mascot is no joke. The dude's doing some serious CrossFit boot camps. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> he's nuts. I mean, he's he's next level in the dancing. He is top-notch mascot for sure. Well, the Jets need to hire him because they need a mascot that can do something. I don't even know what their mascot is. I don't even know if they have one I because they I haven't do. been. They it's ridiculous. They Maybe they the fireman head was one and that's done. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's definitely a mascot. A mascot of his stupidity. Anyways, my question to you is, when you see yourself as an analyst and broadcasting and all the stuff that you've done for BYU, have you ever thought about moving forward, maybe doing professional football or something of that magnitude? Definitely uh, pro, pro football, national college football, for sure. I've always been more of a college guy. I love the NFL, but college football, definitely for sure. National, I'm always open to anything. But yeah, covering BYU was something that's been a passion of mine since really I got started when I was like 19 years old and just been doing this wow. for a long period of time and built up a following and an audience for it. And it, it's great. BYU fans, it's amazing because they're a program that's outside the power conferences. And you would think, People, are they are they that passionate for a program that's outside the power conferences? But yeah, BYU has just a passionate following of fans, and it's connected to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and people have a deep bond and connection to BYU football and BYU sports, and it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it a lot, and the, the connections and the relationships. And really, too, one thing, and you guys will see it too, is Zach Wilson is a polished interview. He's fantastic, and it just seems like BYU, I don't know what it is about the place, but they're well-spoken guys guys they're likable individuals and even if they have some struggles you're going to be kind of like rooting for those guys just because they, they carry themselves in a great way on and off the field for the most part and it's just a lot of fun to cover it's a great program to cover and getting to cover guys like zach wilson who are next level talented it's fun to say to see each and every snap of those guys throughout their career well you're very talented i wish you all the luck in the world hey thanks guys appreciate hopping on and it was a lot of fun mitch before you go tell the fans how they can find you on social media yeah at mitch underscore harper or kslsports.com go check it out so we'll be following a lot of jets content too and awesome. zach wilson stuff so i'll share my insight and thoughts on, on zach wilson throughout the process still so it's gonna be a lot of fun kslsports.com and at mitch underscore harper we definitely like to get you on as the new season begins we would love to talk a little byu football and your thoughts of zach wilson in the middle of the season you got it guys let me know Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mitch. Mitch Harper, ladies and gentlemen, great, great interview. Guy gave us some insight. He has a lot of personality. When we come back, we're going to go pick our top three winners, our top three losers in the NFL draft, and then we're going to talk about the hot and crazy defensive New York Knicks and the Brooklyn Bombshell Nets. And by the way, James Harden's coming back before the playoffs. So you know what that means. Their big three is ready to attack as the New York Knicks are ready to oblige. When we come back, we will get into basketball as well here 
on the Weekend Crunch. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm doing it nice like a robot. No, I'm just kidding. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Errol Marks, my co-host, Speedy Petey. Shout out to Little Jay himself. He's taking care of his wife. He is not with us tonight. Joshua Silverberg. But, you know, we can do it without him. I'm just kidding. We love you, Josh. Hopefully everything is okay. Remember, you can listen to our show every single Saturday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. New York Eastern Time only on 103.9, the LI News Radio Network. Brought to you by New York Sports Team Magazine and the World Wide Sports Radio Network. Download the World Wide Sports Radio app. How do you do that? You go to iOS, WWSRN, or Android, World Wide Sports Radio Network. We are the voices of Long Island Sports Radio and all over the country. We are the voices of sports radio. So check out our great and powerful network. And you can listen to our show every Wednesdays and Thursdays at 9 p.m. The Sports Loudmouths. It's definitely a show you cannot miss. We get some great guests and we have some great insight of what's going on in sports. And we like to have fun. So if you're not a fan, well, you better become one because we are here. And we're here to stay. And I'm not going to sing the Fruity Pebbles song anymore. (laughs) Anyways, I want to get into our NFL winners and losers before we get into NBA. Our top three winners and our top three losers in this year's draft. Are you ready? Here we go. All right. Our winners for 2021 NFL Draft. Number one. You know it. The New York Jets. I think the Jets had a very good draft. I love Elijah Vera Tucker at number 14 moving up. You give the Jets a Quinn Nelson type of talent. You have Zach Wilson as your number one now. And now you bring in Elijah Moore. I think he's going to be that wide receiver that is going to be their second, possibly number one if Denzel Mims doesn't work out. I do believe Denzel Mims is the one. Elijah Moore is the number two. I think they really solidified that part of their offense. And then Michael Carter going in the fourth round. A uh, second-round graded talent on my board going to the New York Jets at number four. He could be an absolute stud at the running back position. I loved what the Jets did in the fourth round, and I, I love what they did throughout the draft. So I give them my number one. My number two, the Miami Dolphins. I love what Miami did in the first round. I think that when you look at Miami and what they were trying to figure out is – who and what their identity was. Well, they proved it. Speedy, you look at the first two picks that they had in the first round. What did you think? I didn't like Waddle as much as I liked really? Smith. Really? I love Jalen Waddle. As much as I like Smith, I would have taken Smith in that spot. I'm not going to say Waddle. Waddle. I'm not going to say Waddle Bigger was stronger. a bad pick, but I still would have preferred Smith in that spot among the Alabama receivers. I think he's more all-around skilled than Waddle is. So I don't mind the pick. 18, I didn't really like with Jalen Phillips. I thought they reached on that in that spot. I, I know they need edge rushing help, but I thought there was definitely some more offense they could have gone in that direction with one of the tackles How about their on second the board. Pick? Uh, J- uh, Javon Holland wasn't bad in that spot. They didn't again. I not, like that. He was my number two safety after Trayvon Morig. I don't mind that kind of pick. I think he's versatile. He could be a slot corner type. And the Dolphins' secondary on paper is very good. But again, they, they definitely could use some safety depth considering they have a lot of had a lot of veterans that got hurt. I think they cut Bobby. Were McCain. they on your top three? No, they were not in my oh, top three. Oh, you smell. Yeah. My third, the Chargers. I love what they did. They added Slater. He fell to them at number thirteen. Mm-hmm. I, I think he really fit what they were trying to do. It wasn't Elijah Vera Tucker. That really solidified where the Jets were going. And how about in the second round, adding, to me, one of the best corners in this year's draft, Asante Samuel Jr., really solidified their defense. I think they're a really dangerous team this year. They added some good youngsters later in the rounds. I love what San Diego did. So those are my top three. Jets, number one. Miami, two. And the Chargers, number three. All right, yeah, I, I agree with you on the Jets number one. I think Jets number one for sure. They got great value throughout the draft with Elijah Moore especially. I think was especially a good value pick. He was my fifth wide receiver and one of my top 20 overall players, maybe even top 15. They did great with that. Obviously, Elijah Vera Tucker and Zach Wilson. And Michael Carter, too, is a shifty guy that I think really fits that offense. So I think the Jets are definitely one. One late-round winner I think that did very well was the Cleveland Browns. Two great values with Greg Newsom. Newsom at number 26, who was supposed to be maybe a top 20 type pick. The corner depth for Cleveland last year was was one of their bigger weaknesses. They lost Greedy Williams to injury. Terrence Mitchell was not good whatsoever. What are they going to do with Greedy? Man? They're going to have to hope that he can play. A greedy man. That's what Greedy called. plays well when he's healthy. He's just he's turning into Kevin White and not being on the field. So I don't know what's going on with that. But they lost to Marius Randall, who was a good slot corner for them. And Terrence Mitchell is not good at all. So now they could actually trust somebody. The Greedy in Man can. <laughs> who could actually play more. And Cleveland has quietly had one of the best off-seasons so far, getting a lot of depth on the defense. They get Grant Delpit back as well in their secondary. And then Jeremiah Wusu in the second round, too. A lot of people had him in the first round as the second-best or third-best linebacker. 
and they got him in the second round. You were saying it on the sports lab mouse. You probably fell because of the versatility. You don't yep. know where he's going to play mm-hmm. type thing. But I don't think Cleveland needs to really worry about that because Cleveland has a lot of depth on that defense, especially bringing in Anthony Walker now. They brought in John Johnson from the Rams to play safety. So I think they have a lot of different areas they could play at Wooster. So they're my second winner. And my final winner is the team that traded with the New York Giants, the Chicago Bears. I think they did fantastic. Considering how little picks they had, obviously they traded up to get their guys, but Justin Fields, somebody they needed, my second-best quarterback, and a guy that I think is really, really getting undervalued in this draft for whatever reason. He can make all the throws. Yeah, you mentioned he has some trouble with reading the first reads, but I think that was also Ohio State's offense getting into that. And he's going to have a tough task with Chicago because they don't have a lot of great offensive weapons, but it's definitely what they needed. And again, I don't think they gave up a huge haul to trade up for that spot. Yeah, they gave up another first-round pick, okay. But it could have been a lot worse than what we've seen. And then Tevin Jenkins in the second round. They get their left tackle. They've had bad tackles for a long time. Even in the year when they made the playoffs, they, their tackles were not we good. We didn't ask you what they got. I think considering how little picks they had, they did a fantastic job. Ryan Pace definitely went to one extreme after not doing well for the Bears in the past. You know what? I'm going to take out the Miami Dolphins. I'm going to put the Arizona. I think Arizona really solidified what they needed to do. Adding themselves a pass rusher and a beast of a man in Javon Collins, who, Collins, who I think is going to be a beast of a man, 16, right after Mac Jones was drafted. By the way, from the New England Patriots, I'm sure Patriot fans want to jump off a ledge. Oh, I think was my top three quarterback. But anyway, I love what they did, bringing in a wide receiver in Moore in the second round. Rondell Moore in the second round, I think, really solidified their wide receiving core as well. So I love what they did. So I'll put them at number two. And then I will take out Miami, even though Miami did well. Jets, Cardinals, Chargers. Yes, that's where I'm going. As far as my losers are concerned, number one, the Dallas Cowboys. Micah Parsons going in the first round, number 12. I think he was their best pick. Evaluation is, if he stays out of trouble, he's one of the most talented defensive players in this draft. I didn't like what they did in the second round and in Kelvin Joseph. That made no sense. I think he was a third-round talent on my board. They added some value in the third round with the three third-round picks that they had in Wright, Galston, and I can't pronounce his name, Aja Juwawa, but uh, I'm talking about. <laughs> UCL. And, and they added Jabril Cox in the fourth round, which I think was a steal. I thought he was yes. a third-round talent. Mm-hmm. But I think they added too many linebackers, so they are a loser in my eyes. No question that they were. Seattle was another team I think was a big loser for me. Seattle's always a loser because they didn't have a first round because they lost it from the Jets. In the second round, they added Dwayne Askridge. He was a real long shot. I thought he was a third, possibly a fourth round talent. We've seen them do this before. And then in the fourth round, adding a DB, a Trey Brown, not a bad player, but not a fourth round talent either. Hopefully he turns out to be good. They only had really three draft picks this year. They lost everything. They practically gave it all away. And they added Stone, Forsyth. Another team that lost in, in the position that they were, the New Orleans Saints. Peyton Turner in the first round, that was pushing, that was taking a reach on that. I, it didn't make any sense. Pete Warner going to second round, Ohio State. Nice player, linebacker. I don't know if he was a second-round talent. I think he was a third-round talent. And then fourth round, Ian Book, who I think is very underrated as a quarterback in this class, I thought probably could have been drafted in the third round. I think he was their steal in the whole draft. Really? <laughs> I, I, don't, I didn't see anywhere him picking the third round. But. Yeah, I like Ian Book. So I have them as my third bad team. All right, I agree with you on Dallas as definitely being number one. I think they reached a lot. And even Parsons, who I like as a player, it's not a need for them. I know Sean Lee retired, but you still got Jalen Smith. You still got Leighton Van Der Esch. They could have gotten linebacker later and been okay with it. They just really need better injury replacement types from what they did. I like the pick of Jabril Cox. That was really, I think, the only great value. They reached a lot the rest of the draft. So Dallas is definitely a loser. Number two, this is maybe coming as a bit of a surprise because their first round pick was great, but the Lions, I don't think, did well either. I think two defensive I tackles. They did well. Two defensive tackles, that's not really a big need for them. They need receiver, they need edge rushers, they need secondary help, and they draft two defensive tackles. I like the player in Anzuruki from Washington, but I don't think it's a need for them. Ali McNeil in the third round, no. I don't mind the kid Melifon, but that's really it. And I, I don't think they did well either, considering they needed to hit on a lot of those early picks. So they're number two for me. And number three, I'm going to do a similar theme to you, a team that didn't have a first-round pick and reached badly in the second round on a receiver, the team in the Seahawks division, the LA Rams. They also reached for a guy that it's like 150 something pounds and 2 2 Atwell. Uh, again, another team that doesn't need a receiver. Cup, Woods, and uh, they lost Josh Reynolds, but okay. They drafted Van Jefferson in the second round last year. They don't need any more receivers. And considering how limited of picks they had, I think they really did a bad job too. So those are my three losers. So there you go. Our top three winners and our top three losers of the NFL draft. And you know, I love this music. It reminds me of football, Sunday night football. It's my favorite part. And the music really gets me pumped up. 
I remember the Odell Beckham one-handed catch. This music really just took off after that. So great music. Unfortunately, the rest of the game didn't for the Giants. They uh, fell apart in the second half. Uh, that was against the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> that was. Uh, I'm sure you love that. But anyway. No, I do not love them falling apart in the second half. <laughs> Why not? Uh, the Beef loved it. Yeah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> Why not? I don't care what the Cowboys fans want to love or well, not. No, the love. beef loves it. And I know you love the beef, don't you? you no, adore I do not beef? love the beef. <laughs> well, Jeff loves the beef, don't you think? Jeff wants nothing more than just to make him cry. <laughs> well, I mean, he likes to make everybody cry, including our great and powerful co-host, Joshua Silverberg, who he picks on every single day. But he didn't really pick on him this past week, so I was very surprised. He was more attacking me. So, interesting guy. Thank you, Jeff. I love you very, very much. Anyway, before we go to break, I wanted to get in some basketball, and the Hottest team in the NBA is not the L.A. Lakers. It is not the Utah Jazz. It is not the Golden State Pukes. <laughs> it is the New York Knicks. Who would have thought in the second half of the season, going into the first week of the second half of the season, Randall was not playing well. Julius Randall looked tired. Everybody thought, oh, here we go, the downfall of the New York Knicks. But no, Tom Thibodeau has holded it together. R.J. Barrett, some of the acquisitions he made before the trade deadline with Derrick Rose, really has solidified this team. The leadership quickly is a great player. Toppin's starting to play, and he's starting to play well. I love what this team is. They're a very young, talented team. Thank God Kyrie Irving and all the great talented players that went over there to Brooklyn and Kevin Durant and James Harden not there with the New York Knicks really ruining the chemistry of this Knicks team. I am very excited about this team, Speedy. Yeah, you have to be very excited. The way they've been able to grow, even when Randall was not playing well in that stretch, other guys were stepping up. Derrick Rose had the best stretch of his Knicks career in that time. R.J. Barrett played very well. Even saw some of the young bench Speaking players. of a guy that's playing definitely, definitely good basketball, R.J. Barrett. Yeah, absolutely. These other guys off the bench, they found ways to get good when other guys were struggling. Obviously, these veteran bench players have been streaky throughout the year. At the beginning of the year, Doc Rivers' son played great, and then all of a sudden he fell off the, face of the earth, and now he's with the Thunder or something. Well, we have an Austin on our network. He's probably a better basketball player than Austin. I'll have to ask him if he has a father named Doc. Well, we'll, we'll I'll find know. out. He, he, I'll be his Doc. <laughs> <laughs> so it was him for a while. Then it I was, think I am his Doc. Then Alec Burke started to play well, and then Reggie Bullock started playing well. So there are different veteran guys that have stepped up. Same thing with the young guys, too. Emmanuel quickly has played phenomenally all year. His game has become a lot more well-rounded, well-rounded than what it was at Kentucky, and a lot of that has to do with Tom Thibodeau. A lot has to do with even Payne with what he what he's done, improving his game from what it was at Kentucky, where he was mainly just a, a six-man type three-point shooter. Could shoot free throws, too, but his game has grown a lot more from that, too. And then when Randall started to heat up again, then obviously the team started to do well with it, too. So overcoming things like that is what makes this kind of winning team, makes this kind of winning culture where you can rely on other guys. You don't have to just rely on one superstar all the time. Now, the Knicks' depth is not insane on paper in comparison to other contending teams, but... There's maybe three teams in the whole league that has unbelievable depth. The rest of the teams in the NBA are fighting and figuring out who their 10th and 9th and 8th guys are. But in terms of the expectations of what the Knicks' depth was supposed to be versus what it has become this year, I think has really been a massive improvement. Mm, I think that where you look at the New York Knicks and where the Knicks are this season has been spectacular. Tom Thibodeau, to me, is the coach of the year. There's no question. Julius Randle is comeback player of the year. He should be an MVP candidate. Define why Steph Curry is an MVP candidate makes no sense to me. Even in uh, a semi not Steph Curry. You have to I'm, just, Curry. <laughs> I'm just saying they're an eight seed. They're barely making the playoffs. And this guy has 31 points a game. And everybody says, oh, he's the MVP. He's not an MVP. I think that when you look at most valuable player, he is the most valuable piece to your team. That's going to help you. Look at Julius Randle. The Knicks went to a non-playoff team all the way to a, over 500, seven games over 500 in what he has done and really has helped the New York Knicks really solidify who they are in the Eastern Conference. So in my eyes, Julius Randle is my top five when it comes to MVP candidates. Chris Paul being at the West is one of the hardest divisions we've seen in a very, very long time. And they're the number two seed from a team that barely made the playoffs. They didn't even make the playoffs last year. Yeah, they made the bubble, went undefeated, but yeah. <laughs> to me, I think that when you look at the big picture and, and where the New York Knicks are, they've really solidified themselves as one of the best young teams and the number one defensive team going into the playoffs. So that's something good to say. But yeah, the massive improvement of the defense is the biggest thing. Like Usually those kinds of things do not happen overnight where you all of a sudden go from number 25. A massive leap they made overnight is just Maybe insane. I should spank you or something. Maybe we'll use a nice umbrella. 
because it's not going to have to be open. So no bad luck here. So now we're going to umber- umbrella superstitions, everybody. Well, you don't like to spank monkeys, so there you go. Why would I harm a monkey? That's not the kind of monkey I'm talking about. But anyways, the Brooklyn Nets are also playing very good basketball. And I think the fact that Kevin Durant is back, I didn't think that he was going to come back until the playoffs. He's played very, very well since he's come back. I think he's averaging about 29, 30 points a game. Kyrie Irvin is, to me, the MVP of the team. He's played fantastic since the injuries of Kevin Durant and, obviously, James Harden. James Harden came out the other day saying he will be back for the playoffs, which is a very good option for the Brooklyn Nets going into the playoffs. And I think with the way Blake Griffin is playing, some of the players off the bench, you don't need super superstars. But is this team going to be able to hold up defensively? I don't care how offensively sound they are. Are they going to be able to hold up? And is Steve Nash, a rookie coach, going to be able to figure things out in the playoffs when it becomes a half-court game? It's going to be interesting with the depth, especially. I think when we had Ian Eagle on the show, he mentioned guys like Bruce Brown have, have played well in his place. Jeff Green, who has always been a good veteran guy for the Grizzlies with the Celtics and several other teams. So they're going to need those guys, whether it's them, whether it's Landry Shamit, Joe Harris, guys off the bench. Shamu! Like, <laughs> that's what we call it. Yeah, they're going to need those guys to play well because the Nets... In terms of superstardom, we know they have it. But in terms of the depth against other That's teams, I am. like Milwaukee, at their full strength, the Boston Celtics, even though they've been down this year, teams like that that have more depth than them, they're going to have to Speedy, I think you should be the Nets ups. mascot. Why would I want to be the Nets mascot? I think you would be good. I think you would be very, very funny. You don't even have to put on a costume by yourself. I mean, with your hood and everything like that. Go out Why there. would that represent the Brooklyn Nets? <laughs> it would be very interesting. Why would a re- random weird-looking guy in a sweatshirt well, at least you know you're weird represent looking. the Brooklyn Nets? <laughs> <laughs> well, they need some kind of mascot, and why not the great Speedy Petey? I think it would be very intriguing and very interesting. Why not have Uncle Drew be the mascot? <laughs> well, who's Uncle Drew? Oh, are you talking about Kyrie Irving? Yeah. Why not have the... Because he has to be on the basketball court. He's not going to be... Well, he's not up. on the basketball court all the time either, though. <laughs> well, that's true. He's hiding over there. So when he plays, we can, you can have the, the, the movie Uncle Drew. We can have him that. And when he's not playing, he can be the mascot. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, because when he does play, they're going to need him on the court, especially in the playoffs. Of course. Why would he have to be a mascot so when that, he knows so that, he's got to be on so the court? The movie Uncle Drew becomes the mascot of the playoffs. Well, there you go. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into the New York Yankees. John Carlos Stanton is the hottest hitter in baseball. What does that say to Yankee fans? Well, I will say one thing. They're not going to be throwing balls at him right now. Aaron Judge is one of the poorest hitters right now on the New York Yankees. What he needs to do to get back on track. We will get into that. And the New York Mets, well, they need to learn how to hit. Maybe we'll take them to be we hitting batting cages or something because I don't know what the heck is going on with them. Their best hitter is Jacob DeGrom, and that is their best pitcher. So when we come back, we will get into the woes of New York baseball here on the Weekend Crunch. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Weekend Crunch. I'm your host, Daryl Marks. My co-host tonight, yes, it's not Joshua Silverberg. It is the great and powerful world of Oz, Speedy Petey and his tidy whities. And he's our board op, as always. Remember, you can listen to our show every single Saturday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. New York Eastern Time only on 103.9 the LI News Radio Network. Brought to you by New York Sports Team Magazine and the World Wide Sports Radio Network. Download the World Wide Sports Radio app by going to iOS, WWSRN, or Android World Wide Sports Radio Network. I will say this, guys. We are talking about New York baseball. The New York Yankees, I guess you you could say they're finding their sticks. And I'm not talking about those sticks, ladies and gentlemen, but they're finding their bats. And and John Carlos Stanton is really holding and sticking it all together. And the Yankees are still the fourth seed right now in the AL East. But I think they're still very, very dangerous. And the Red Sox started off very, very strong, starting to get into a slump in the last 10 games. They're 6-4. and four, But the Yankees' bats are starting to find their way. And that's a good sign for the Yankees. John Carlos Stanton, like I said, was the hottest hitter in baseball in the last two weeks. Batting 312, has uh, nine home runs already this year. He's got close to 20 RBIs. His on-base percentage is over 100. 1,000. So he's been unbelievable. Yankee fans, I don't know why you're throwing balls at him because this guy is holding that offense together and stringing everything along. Gary Sanchez, people want out. We've been hearing a little bit about Glaber Torres on his woes this year. They had to bring Miguel Andahar up because Gio Urshela is hurt. So maybe we'll see back a great hitter in Miguel Andahar, a rookie of the year candidate a couple of years ago, and then he tore his shoulder and then he went back to the minors and hasn't been the same player. Maybe we see the Miguel Andahar that everybody thought was going to be an all-star, a talented player for the Yankees for many, many years to come. Losing Gio Urshela does hurt the Yankees, loses a defensive player in that lineup, but I think this is a good move for the New York Yankees. I think the Yankees are starting to figure things out as far as their pitching is concerned as well. 
Yeah, and I think the Yankees are really getting a whole sense of just self-confidence again. There was a lot of pressure in the beginning of the season, obviously being in New York, being the favorites that they were. Not that the Mets don't have to deal with that either, and they still haven't been able to overcome it yet, but the Yankees usually do this where they have a little bit of a down stretch. It took a little longer for them, but John Collis Stanton's definitely right now carrying that team, carrying that offense that has had a lot of trouble this year, a lot of down players. You were talking about Aaron Judge before the break being down, Glaber Torres being down, and Stanton, nine home runs, which is second in the majors right now, tied for second, only to a cool J.D. Martinez and Shohei Otani. So that's pretty good company to be one home run behind with right now. And the Yankees pitching has done a lot better. Araldis Chapman's rejuvenated himself. He's having a phenomenal year so far to start the year with all the Yankees bullpen injuries that they've had and the losses they had in the offseason. Best and relief pitcher in baseball. So right? far he has been. And he's been... Best re- he's ever looked, yeah, I think. Really impressive considering it looked like he was struggling. Redefined and, his pitching method. He struggled really badly in the second half of 2019 and then into 2020. So he really rejuvenated himself nicely and essentially essentially is carrying that bullpen. So I think they've really done a nice job in terms of playing to the team that they needed to be. Again, they need to get a little more well-rounded throughout the lineup. They need other guys to start hitting, but Stanton's been a spark for them for sure. And even some of the young guys on, on the bench and just rotating guys, have, they've served their roles to, to win games. And then shout out to what all the fans are doing at the Astros the no, series. That was yes. hilarious. Oh, and that's why the Yankees swept them. I think it was a great series for the Yankees. It really solidified who they are moving forward. I hope the Yankees start to figure things out and start hitting the ball and get back on track. As far as the New York Mets are concerned, well, they're not hitting anything. The fact that they're in second place in the NL East is, is pretty amazing because Philadelphia has played good baseball, even losing Bryce Harper for a significant time, getting hit in the head with a baseball going 96 miles per hour. I think Bryce is back now. I, I think Miami has played very good baseball, and so has Atlanta. They've played a little bit better, and I think Atlanta's the team that you have to worry about because once they get hot, and as it gets hotter out, this is a team that can absolutely take over this division. Even though they're pitching staff is not the Mets. It's not even the Philadelphia Phillies, but I think their lineup is as good as any lineup in baseball. And when this lineup figures something out, I think they're going to start hitting. So the Mets have to figure something out. Lindor is not hitting. I think he's batting 186. I mean, you can't win when you're a $340 million player. Can't hit a lick. So I don't know what's going on. He's defending the ball. He's playing very well defensively, but offensively, he just looks horrible. And all the shortstops in the league have looked horrible this year. So I'm very interested to see what the Mets are going to do. Their pitching staff has played a little bit better. They didn't look good last night, but all in all, I think that Jacob DeGrom being your lead guy, your lead horse, he's the guy that you're going to lean on as the season progresses. The Mets have had definitely some surprises in terms of who's expected to do well and struggle and burst out of nowhere. You're definitely right about Lindor. He's, he hasn't found it yet. 186 batting average. He's drawn some walks lately, but that's really it. He had a really bad 0 for 26 slump that he snapped out of last night, but still, he has not found his groove yet. Alonzo and McNeil have started to play well, which is a good sign for the Mets, but overall, the biggest problem is the biggest problem they had last year, situational hitting. They had the second best on-base percentage in the National League last year, and yet they were in the bottom half of the National League and run scored, so that has to say a lot. You don't make the playoffs in a year where you're favored to at least make it in the shortened year with the eight teams, and they didn't even do that, and now they're lucky that the division's so weak, like you were saying, with the Braves struggling the way they have. Their pitching, I think, will get back into it. They have two guys in Anderson and Freed that are both hurt right now, so they have a chance to bounce back and play well, I think, as well, too. They were my World Series pick at the start of the year, and you're right. I think they will get hot at some point. The Marlins, I think, will cool off. The Phillies, I think, will be what they are at this point because their pitching staff is not trustworthy either. But guys like Vince Velasquez have pitched well and Zach Eflin, they have had stretches so far, but that bullpen is still a big issue for the Phillies. It's going to be very, very fun as the season progresses. It gets a little warmer out. The balls are going to get poppier, and it's going to pop out. Everybody keeps saying that there's something wrong with the balls or maybe they need to cork their bats. Who knows what baseball is going to do? I mean, Rob Manfred's changing all the rules, so who knows? what's going to happen in the near future. But all in all, he's the worst commissioner in professional sports. As moving forward in 2024, maybe he gets fired. So let's hope because baseball is absolutely craving a new GM. I, I'm sorry, commissioner. I said GM because I, I think maybe that's all he is. Well, the Mets might need a GM at this point. So maybe so. they'll hire Rob Manford after he gets fired. <laughs> oh, my God. What a terrible situation when it comes to baseball. Maybe they'll rehire Rob Manford and maybe they'll rehire Carlos Beltran as their manager and they'll have a new cheating scandal. <laughs> well, speaking of cheating, scandal. I mean, I wouldn't say cheating scandal, but the New York Rangers. And I will say this. I know a lot of Ranger fans are not very happy with Tom Wilson. And a lot of people are saying that the reason why J.D., John Davidson, and the Rangers GM got fired is because of the whole 
Tom Wilson Panarin situation that they didn't stick up for their player. Just craziness. And I don't think James Dolan did that. I know a lot of people are taking shots at James Dolan all over social media. James Dolan had to do this because the Rangers are not moving in the right direction. I think Quinn needs to be fired as well, but I think he'll be gone at the end of the season. You're bringing Chris Drury. I don't understand Chris Drury. This is a guy that's never been a president. He's never been a GM. Now you're giving him the whole reign to the team. It's not raw. I understand they brought back Glenn Sather, but I don't know if Glenn Sather coming back, he's lost the scoop in the NHL. This is an old man now. He won a Stanley Cup in like the 80s, early, a lot of the late eight, the yeah. late 70s, early 80s with the Edmonton Oilers. Right. So I don't know if Glenn Sather knows what he's doing now. Bringing in a rookie guy that's going to take over as the president slash GM. I think this is a big mistake for the New York Rangers. I think they should have kept John Davidson. If they wanted to fire their GM, fire your GM. Right. But John Davidson was the president. It made no sense why he decided to fire him after two years when John Davidson hasn't, hasn't even really put his stamp to this team. So I think this was a big mistake by the New York. Rangers. I definitely agree in that sense. I, I think Jeff Gorton has been long on the hot seat for a while. Oh, long over terrible. Get, I never really liked him, even when the Rangers were winning. He was making some, a lot of questionable moves. I agree with you on Davidson. I would have definitely hung on to him. Whether it's a James Dolan thing is, is to be determined, because James Dolan is not really involved with the Rangers as much as he has been with the Knicks in the past. So, he's still more of on his own brand, where he doesn't really care as much about hockey. But when it comes to the Wilson thing, that's just disgraceful. That's disgusting what he did. People forget before what he did to Panarin, he did to Buchnevich. He had his stick around Buchnevich's neck on he the did ground, apologize. punching he did, him. He did reach out to Panarin and apologize to Panarin, and he said, let's move on. So that was nice of Tom Wilson. I know he only got fined for $5,000. Which is ridiculous. Uh, He's I a repeat he should... offender who got, he got suspended earlier in the year for a hit on Brandon Carlo of the Boston Bruins. Nobody said Gary Bettman was a smart <laughs> Nobody said Gary Bettman was smart either, but it's also the player safety executives, too, that really have had a lot of trouble justifying different suspensions. We talked about the same problem with the NFL with illegal hits and targeting and stuff like that with Roger Goodell, suspended certain guys. The NHL has the same problem with especially a guy like Tom Wilson who's been a repeat offender for a while. He should have been suspended a lot more. You just keep adding up to it. Like, well, I, I like what Peter Laviette said too. I think he says that a lot of teams are gunning for him because he's 6'6", 225 pounds. I understand Peter's trying to stick up for his player, but I think that's a crock because right. we all know how good Wilson is on the ice. He's a very good player, but he's also a goon. That's right. what he is. He likes to start with the guys that really can't defend themselves. When it comes to the big guys and the strong guys on, like, the Islanders, he curl up in a ball and hide in the corner. He right. doesn't want to fight anybody on the Islanders. Yeah, the same thing with the Bruins, too, like I mentioned earlier. I think Brad Marchand came up to him after the hit on Brandon Carlo, and he, he wasn't this big, tough guy like he was against the Rangers, who the Rangers have never been a they tough team. They don't have an enforcer. Right. They need they don't, an enforcer. The Rangers have never been a tough team since I've been watching them. They haven't been that since the turn of the century. So the Rangers are not the team that really to justify, all right, this guy's a tough guy. And, how and that gonna, was not a hockey play. And, and by the way, like you cannot bring in Chris Jury. You think he's going to figure this out? I mean, Chris Jury was a finesse player. When he came into the league, when he played for the Rangers, when he played for the Colorado Avalanche, if you remember. Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo. He wasn't a roughhouse guy. He was a first-line, second-line guy. He's a talented player, great hands, played for the United States team. Everybody knows him as the captain of the United States team, junior team. Fantastic player. But I don't think he's going to figure that out. I, I think finding goons are very hard to find. And, and to get two or three goons in to protect your players, those are very, very important when you're going into the playoffs. And the Rangers, you see it. That's why they can't compete. That's why he couldn't compete against Carolina last year. And that's why they're going to have problems competing as they move forward. And I don't think Jury is going to figure that out. And we've always agreed that you need some level of intensity and toughness to be able to do well in the playoffs. With the exception of the Penguins, with their two Stanley Cups, pretty much all the Stanley Cup winning teams the last 15 years. They were very years, Gritty. I mean, Sidney Crosby's a great yeah, player. They weren't built with that kind of team. You still need some level of toughness. Going back to what Wilson did, though, that wasn't even a hockey thing. That was just uh, him just being aggressive, a roid rage type thing. And Ooh, <laughs> you, you ra bringing your stick around Buchnevich's neck and then slamming Panera into the ground. That's not hockey. Like that, None of that's hockey plays. Oh, I don't it's think, fun. Come I on. don't think any hockey it's fan... fighting. Is, I love it. Is it fighting, though, or is it just... It's UFC kind of going. stuff. MMA. I love it. All right, MMA so go have Tom Wilson be an MMA fighter yeah, after his career. Yeah, well, well, you know, we'll put Conor on skates. Can, he won't be hated as much if that's the case. We'll put him against Conor McGregor on skates. That would be funny. That would 
sell? Why not? We'd sell out a whole stadium with Conor McGregor on skates. He learns how to skate, and it becomes a hockey fight. You can use the skates as a knife to try to kill him. I mean, all you need to do. I, I think that would be fun. That would be a great I mean, Tom, sale on paper. Tom view. Wilson he has, what, a 60-pound size advantage on McGregor? But John skates, you know, if, if he's a good skater, he won't be able to catch him. I agree with you. I'm saying Tom Wilson would probably win that in a heartbeat because, I one, don't know I don't it. know if Conor McGregor can skate. And He'll two, do a drop kick. He'll kill him right away. You know, I, I, I know, but I, one, can Conor McGregor skate? And two, there's like a 60 pound pound size gap. Well, I would like to see Wilson kick the hell out of Conor. I'm sure you would. You I don't would. know if that would happen, especially if Conor learns how to skate. He is an Irishman and he comes from a cold country, so who knows? No, they don't really have hockey in the United Kingdom though, or Ireland or anything Ireland, like that. that's where he's from. Do they have much with hockey though? Oh yeah, it's absolutely. Not... There are hockey players that came from Ireland. Absolutely. I know England's had a couple that I can remember, but it's mainly more obviously the Scandinavian countries, now Germany, Switzerland, Austria, places like that more than I've ever seen with England, just because it's an island they have more rain and stuff like the that. The island of Dr. Moreau. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it would be very fun to watch a UFC on ice. Could you have that? Instead of uh, skating on ice or Disney on ice, we'll say the UFC on the life. Go- goons on ice. Not on, <laughs> not on ice, on life. The UFC on ice life. Yes. Fight to, to the death. Well, maybe people will get lice watching Conor McGregor and Tom Wilson. <laughs> I've got lice just thinking about it. I'm sure you do. Uh, those little white things crawling up in my hair. I've got it. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, the final segment of the day. Speedy. Crunch time. Here on the Weekend Crunch. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Weekend Crunch. I'm your host, Errol Marks. My co-host is Speedy Petey tonight. Uh, shout out to Joshua Silverberg. I uh, had some family situation. Uh, I understand. Uh, we do miss you. He will be back next week joining us, as always, on the Weekend Grand Show. Definitely stay tuned for that. Remember, you can listen to our show every single Saturday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. New York Eastern Time only on 103.9, the LI News Radio Network, brought to you by New York Sports Team Magazine and the World. Wide Sports Radio Network. Worldwide Sports Radio app on iOS, WWSRN, and Android. Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You can watch our shows, listen to your shows live, and watch and listen to the replays of our shows. And read our articles, our great articles, our powerful articles on our network. So definitely check out the Worldwide Sports Radio app. Speedy, this show has gone fast, and I will say that Mitch Harper was absolutely fantastic. I think it's going to be very, very fun if you didn't hear the interview to check it out. So BYU reporter and analyst, Mitch Harper. So definitely check it out. Anyways, Speedy, what do we have for the last segment of the day? Crunch time. It's time for Crunch Time. All right, let's start with what we just talked about with Tom Wilson. Buy or sell? Tom Wilson will be suspended at some point during the NHL playoffs. Uh, never. I, I don't think the NHL is going to do that. He's too big of a player to that team, defensively, offensively. He is a mean player. I think he'll get himself into trouble, but you can't suspend a player in a big part of the playoffs. So I'm going to sell that. I'm going to sell it not for the reason you said. I'm going to sell it because I think, feel like they'll get knocked out early like they usually do, where I don't know if he's going to get to that point where they're going to get suspended. Peter Laviette. I mean, Laviolette's a great coach. I mean, can he overcome the Capitals' woes of getting 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 knocked out when they shouldn't be knocked out. I mean, granted, they have the one seed right now, and Laviolette's done a great job in certain instances, but it's not like Peter Laviolette hasn't been vulnerable to some early round exits, too. And we know the Capitals have certainly been. So I'm just going to sell it just for that reason, not for the fact that he's not going to instigate anything like that. All right, buy or sell. The Phoenix Suns, who currently are one game back of the Utah Jazz, the Phoenix Suns will finish with the best record in the NBA. I'm going to buy it. I think the Phoenix Suns are the hottest team right now in basketball in the Western Conference. And by the way, they have Chris Paul, who's 100% healthy, which I haven't said that in a long time. So if Chris Paul stays healthy, I absolutely believe with the injuries that Utah has, they will be the number one seed. So I'm going to buy it. And he is, to me, the MVP of the whole league. I'm going to buy it, too, because I think Donovan Mitchell's injury will still keep the Jazz eventually from falling off. I know the Jazz have still been pesky in that time where still they're going to be competitive. But Phoenix, they're really playing with a lot of good confidence. They're winning a lot of close games, which is a big difference for them. And they're winning in ways that they weren't expected to. Their defense was bad at the beginning of the year. Now they're winning with defense, too. So I really like them to finish the regular season as the number one seed. And with the East struggling at times, different teams, I could definitely see it. So I will also buy it. All right, buy or sell. Somebody that is not Jamar Chase or Devontae Smith will lead the rookies in receiving yards. You know what? 
I'm going to take the New York Jets, Elijah Moore. I, I think with the offense that they're going to be running over there, I guess Jets, San Francisco offense, I think he's going to see a lot of balls coming his way. I think he's going to be a very big, intricate part of what Zach Wilson's growth is going to be this year and a very big piece. So I'm going to go with Elijah Moore. So I'm going to buy that Elijah Moore will be the different guy. I am going to sell it. I think it will be Devontae Smith. I think the target share is just too good, but the Eagles having a lot of injury-prone receivers. Jalen Hurts knowing how to play with him well. I think it's just too easy, even if it doesn't lead to team success right away with the other receivers and with the new coach. I feel like he's going to get force-fed a lot in the beginning of the year. And knowing Jalen Hurts, obviously Jalen Hurts transferring to Oklahoma too, but knowing Jalen Hurts more than obviously a lot of the other receivers would, I think he'll give him an edge. I think the target share is just going to be too good for him there. I'm going to definitely sell that. All right, buy or sell. Giancarlo Stanton will finish in the top five in the major leagues in home runs. I am going to buy that. If, if John Carlos Stanton stays healthy, I think he scores and hits about 45 home runs and, and scores about 130 RBIs. I think he's going to be an MVP candidate. I think Yankee fans need to calm down and let this guy play. I think he's a big part of their offense this year. DJ LeMayo is not playing well. Glaber Torres hasn't played well. They need John Carlos Stanton's bat in this lineup. And he's a DH. He's not playing in the outfield, which is very, very important to keep this guy healthy. So I'm going to buy that. He'll be in the top five in home runs in the major leagues. I'm going to sell it. I just don't know if I trust him to stay healthy. I know that being the DH helps a lot, but again, he's still been an injury-prone player, so I think it's due to happen at some point. I think he'll be top ten. I think he'll be steadily carrying the Yankees' offense, but top five, you need to stay healthy the whole year to be able to do that. So far, so good, but again, can you trust him for a long period of time is another question. All right, buy or sell. The Lakers have had their woes lately. They will finish as one of the play-in teams. They're right now tied with the Blazers for the sixth seed. They have the tiebreaker at the moment, 37-29. and 29. Buy or sell, they will be one of the four play-in teams. No, I don't think they will. I think they'll figure something out. LeBron James isn't 100% healthy. I think everybody sees that. But I think as the playoffs come closer, you do not want to play the L.A. Lakers. So I think LeBron James will figure things out. And I, I've been reading so many crazy things that he's done – He's not the same LeBron James. We hear that all the yeah, time. Yeah, okay. He has not looked good the first three games he's been back, but I, I'm sure he'll figure it out. So I am going to sell that. I'm going to sell it too because also the other factor is Dallas, can they stay in the five seed for that long either? They're only just a game up on that. And while Luka Doncic is playing, another guy that's playing like an MVP that is not getting talked about a lot, how long can they keep up their hot streak too? They're not a great team on paper. And if, if the Lakers get any of those guys back with injury within that stretch, it's just one game for them to surpass it. I can't really see that happen. Portland's kind of leveled out after, after they've had a hot streak. So I'm going to sell it as well. I really don't know if the Lakers are going to fall off to all the way to seven. And plus LeBron says he comes out and says he, he hates the setup. So I think he'll be a little motivated if he does play to, to stop himself from being that. So, all right, buy or sell. If John Davidson gets another job with an NHL team, He's going to lure John Tortorella away from the Columbus Blue Jackets. Could possibly happen, even though Columbus has come out and said that uh, John Tortorella is a guy that they want to bring back. And I think Torts will get paid next year, and I think he'll be back with the Blue Jackets. But quite possibly, I don't know where John Davis is going. I think his dream job was the New York Rangers. He was there two years, and he gets fired. I think it was terrible. Terrible firing by the New York Rangers. So... I'm going to sell that. I don't think Torch is going with them. I'm going to sell it, too, because I think the Blue Jackets are going to do whatever they do to maybe even if they overpay John Tortorella just to hang on to him. If John Tortorella leaves that team, it's going to be very hard for them to recover because their team on paper, it's, it's not terrible, but it's it's not great. They don't have a lot of great young prospects that are really saying, all right, this team could be good for a while. Zach Wierenski, who's been their best player, has been injury prone. You know, Seth Jones has been was hurt last year. Now they have Patrick Laine. Will they re-sign him? There's just too many question marks with that team. So I think they're going to do whatever they could to at least hang on to Tortorella because it's going to be very unlikely for them to keep those players. All right, buy or sell. Aaron Rodgers will still be a Green Bay Packer by week one. Ah, I'm going to sell it. No way in hell. I don't care what Green Bay has said. They're just saying that, waiting till June, buying their time, and I think they'll trade him to the Broncos. That's where I think he's heading. I think the Broncos, even though they added Teddy Bridgewater and gave up a six-round draft pick, I just think it makes a lot of sense. Heading to the AFC, which is dangerous moving forward, especially in that division. And guess what? Patrick Mahomes versus Aaron Rodgers. Two games in a year. That'll be fun. Everyone's wanted that for the Super Bowl. Now they might get that in division. But yeah, isn't that weird to think? This is finally the first time we can say the AFC is actually a more well-rounded conference than the NFC. Yeah. Finally. It's like the first time in, what, 15 years? Spanking that, I can say that, that chicken, Speedy. Yeah. Spanking that chicken. I agree with you. I'm going I'm to sell it, too. I think it'll drag out a little longer than people think. But I still think I, I still think it'll be before week one. It's not going to last until maybe at it's the It's either earliest. that or he'll be playing. Yeah. 
He might even be doing that anyway. Uh, Jeopardy. Points. Yeah. Anyway. Retiring and hanging out with Speedy P. I don't think he'll settle for that. But well, you know, he settled to get married, so why not settle with you? Well, there's a difference between me and the girl. That well, he let's married. dress you up as a woman. Maybe he'll. Uh, I don't think that'll matter. Attractive. I don't think that'll matter. I don't think Aaron Rodgers is going to want to have his dating life revolve around something like Tootsie, yeah, the Tootsie I mean, that, kind of scenario. Is that what you are, Tootsie kind of scenario? Well, okay, you know, either that or some kind of like Mrs. Doubtfire younger person. But well, you're a scary Mrs. Doubtfire, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, nonetheless, I think I think it'll drag maybe at the latest probably into training camp. But I don't see much more than that. If he's still not happy in training camp, I think he'll be as good as gone. Whether they'll be at the Broncos or maybe who knows, maybe there'll be another suitor at that point. Injuries can always happen in OTAs. I agree with you. I am going to sell that as well. All right, buy or sell. We will definitely see the Universal DH full-time next year. Absolutely. I think they're planning to do that. They want to protect the pitchers in the National League. It makes sense. You see John Carlos Stanton. He doesn't have to play in the outfield. I think that will solidify him to be healthy practically the whole season, which will give him the 40 or 45 home runs. I think the Yankees were planning for this to happen to a player of that magnitude. I think there are a lot of teams, including the New York Mets, that would love to just put a positional player in the DH role a whole season. So I'm going to buy that. As much as I don't want it to happen, I'm going to buy it as well. I feel like it's Bob inevitable. And friggin' I'm... Manford. <laughs> I think it's inevitable at this point with the, the types of players that are just coming up on these teams. There's so many power guys off the bench, so many random guys that hit home runs, so many just these random new guys that you don't even see coming that just all of a sudden play well with these hitters. Even though this year is considered a down year in comparison to what it's been home run-wise in the years past, I still think you'll see it just on that. And this kind of year... With pitching numbers off the charts, baseball's going to want to encourage hitting more, too. So I feel like it's inevitable to happen. I don't want it to happen. I'm not just saying that because I'm a National League fan. I like the strategy of the two different leagues. I think it actually makes for good interleague play, good World Series strategy. I don't want it to happen, but I feel like it is inevitable. So I am going to Cannot do about Harry's Wild about me. What movie is that from? My Girl? You ever see My Girl? I did not. Oh, God. I was good. Dan Aykroyd, baby. All right. Dan Aykroyd. I will watch something with Dan Aykroyd. I will keep that in mind. Well, my girl's more of a girly movie. If you want to watch a girly oh, movie. Dan Aykroyd. It's, 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 Dan Aykroyd's it's it. I'll give scary. It, it's sad. I'll give it a little of a chance, at least, just because Dan Aykroyd's it. It's, it's a sad movie. It's funny. All right. One more. The Milwaukee Bucks have started to play well, and they're coming for the Nets. Buy or sell. They will surpass the Nets at the end of the regular season as the two seed, or maybe even surpass the Sixers nah, as the one I, seed. I sell that. I think the Brooklyn Nets have a very good chance of winning the division. And a lot of people think it's going to be smooth sailing in the East. I don't believe that's going to happen. They do not want to play the Knicks. I can tell you that right now. I don't think anybody wants to play. I'm not saying that as a Knicks fan. I think the Nets are going to have a lot of problems in a half-court game when the Eastern Conference playoffs start. So I think they have problems. I, I do believe they're as good as any team in the Eastern Conference. They win the seed. They win the one seed. I say I am going to sell. I'm going to buy that it does happen. Milwaukee surpasses Brooklyn in the regular season. In terms of postseason identity, that's still up in the air with Milwaukee, especially with the depth having a lot more issues than they did in years past. I know they brought in Drew Holiday, which has been good at times, but the rest of the depth guys that really was doing well for them last year hasn't been doing that, so their team offense as a whole hasn't been as good. So I'm actually more worried about their playoff identity, but I think they'll be fine for the regular season because, again, the Nets have had a little bit of a skid. I think they're going to just try to ease their way back in, even with James Harden coming back. I think they're still going to try to ease him in to Kevin Durant. He's played well. Will it last will be another question. Again, it's not going to be by much. They're tied in the standings right now. It might be even by a game, but I think Milwaukee is going to try to push for that harder because I feel like they're going to want to need the home court advantage a lot more than somebody like the Brooklyn Nets will where they could just trust their stars to be able to do it. And again, even that team like the Sixers too, that's going to be a tough out for them as Whoop, well. There it is. So there you go. I th I'm going to buy that. I think Milwaukee surpasses them for the two seed, even though I don't necessarily trust them in the playoffs. Sell it. Unless, it's the, unless the depth will step up. They played well the other day against the Nets, but I just don't think they, they have enough or will have enough to pass or surpass the Brooklyn Nets. But that's not going to make a difference. I still think Milwaukee could beat them in the playoffs. I think a lot of teams could beat the Nets. I think the Nets are going to have deficiencies moving forward, not because of their bench. I just think that even with James Harden, they've only played seven games together all season long. They're still figuring each other out. This is the same thing that happened to Miami the first year. They lost in the finals against Dallas. I think that could happen with the Brooklyn Nets. I don't know if the Brooklyn Nets are even going to come out of the Easter Conference. I think the 76ers are good. I'm not saying the Knicks are going to win, ladies and gentlemen, but I think the Knicks are going to be a very dangerous out, and I don't think anybody's going to want to play the Knicks, especially the way they're playing. So I think it's fantastic what Tom Thibodeau is doing. I think Knicks fans should be very excited for the future with Quigley and Toppin and some of the young prospects that they have right now with this team and this organization. 
That's it for our show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Joshua Silverberg. Yeah. Mr. Josh, I hope everything is going good with your family. He reached out to me tonight telling me that he wasn't going to make it. He definitely was missed. And I'm sure when he gets back next week, he'll be crying and profiling all this crap that he's going to say about Zach Wilson and how much he loves him. He wants to sniff his underwear. So there you go. Anyways, that's it for our show. Uh, We'll be back next week. Next week, we'll probably have another recorded guest. Maybe we'll have a live guest. I think that would be very, very interesting. I think guests love our show. Mitch was on a show. Dave McCann was on a show. Both guys from BYU. You and I think both guys love to come on our show. They really laughed. They had a good time with us. So a shout out to Mitch. Dave absolutely gave us good insight with BYU football and Zach Wilson. We will be back next week. Until then, this is Harold Marks and Speedy Petey saying good night, and we'll talk to you then. Good night, everybody.